Hello, everyone. Welcome back to All Things Venia. I'm Eli Travers. This is our third week or our third discussion uh, where we just take some element of the wine industry and dig a little deeper and just talk about some things. Um, I'm super, super excited about today because, first of all, I love wine, but I also love cheese and putting them together is just magical. I've spent the last four days with my, my nose deep in books about food and wine pairing, looking up all sorts of things about cheese online. It's been really, really fun. So my plan today and sort of my goal is to, again, sort of work, work through or walk you through a little presentation um, just about the, the basics of food and wine pairing and then more specifically about cheese, sort of a quick 101 about cheese making and then the different styles of cheese and what wines tend to go well with them. And then my hope, I'm, I'm going to try to speed through that uh, and then to leave enough time for us to have more of a discussion. So my hope is that some of you have some cheeses out uh, that you've poured a couple wines. I have a white and a red wine that I'll talk about later um, and and have just just to explore sort of what it's like. Every, every The beautiful thing about food and wine pairing is that it's different for everyone. So it'll be fun for me to hear what you're experiencing and maybe describing the kind of things you're tasting and and what you're trying so without further ado i will share my screen and we will do a short little powerpoint so wine and cheese pairing with me myself eli travers so first a little bit of the basics so this is think of this as food and wine pairing 101 my my goal is down the line we'll do some other uh food and wine pairing suggestions and, and discussions maybe about desserts or specific types of cuisine or certain types of wine. Um, but this is the first time we're talking about it. So I thought I'd do a quick overall, you know, overview of, of the basics. So our goal in food and wine pairing is to balance the aroma, flavor, and texture of the wine with that of the food. It, that's, that's what we're doing. That's in essence, that's what it's all about. When we think about wine first, the texture is really one of the important uh, keys to wine and to figuring out food and wine pairing and it can be broken down into these six main components So we have acidity the acid in the wine is what makes your mouth water um, What's happening in your mouth is that as the the wine goes in your mouth and the, the pH level Drops because there's so much acidity your your body sends more saliva into your mouth to balance the pH And so that's why your mouth will water if you if you don't have wine right now picture yourself biting into a lemon wedge and you'll start to salivate like that that rushing that's that's even your brain will send the signal even without acid in your mouth because it's so uh, programmed and then tannin so tannin are the molecules you'll find in grape skins and seeds um, and this is what dries your mouth out so what's literally happening is the tannin molecules are binding with enzymes in your saliva stripping your saliva of that and that's what sort of gives you that dry mouth sensation that astringency and then we can talk about sweetness in wine uh, and remember even dry wines or technically dry wines can have a little bit of sugar in them um, the body the overall weights of the liquid on your tongue you can think of this as the difference between the way skim milk feels versus two percent or even whole milk that's sort of your light body medium body or or full bodied uh, texture the level of alcohol, so whether or not the wine tastes hot or is there sort of a burn on the back of your throat, um, that can definitely impact how food and wine go together. And then overall, put them all together, is measuring uh, intensity. So it's the overall impression of all those other things combined. And then on the food side of things, uh, the main elements we're looking at when considering food and wine pairing are some of the same stuff. So acid, again, acidity which you'll find in vinegar, any sort of any pickled things, citrus, tomato or tomato sauce is a big one. And then um, other dairy products, so like goat cheese or other lactic acid uh, ingredients. There's salt, which there's lots of salt in food. It's what makes food delicious. It brings out a lot of flavor. Um, but sneakily, you can have salt come in the form of capers or olives or anchovies. And again, certain kinds of cheeses. Uh, fat is really important, whether that's animal fat like marbled meats or butter or lard or cheese or some plant-based fats like olive oil and avocado. Um, spice is very important. So think of all the pepper spices, but also wasabi, horseradish, mustard, some other things. Bitterness is important as well. Dark leafy green vegetables. So think kale, spinach, um, certain chicories, endive, radicchio, things like that. Cocoa, citrus peel. 
Uh, and then again, intensity. So the overall impression of all of those aspects. And the other main thing with food um, is how it's cooked. The different techniques can affect some of those ingredients in the food that might affect what wine you pair with it. So um, high impact um, cooking techniques like smoking, grilling, broiling, roasting, those are, those are cooking methods that will cause caramelization or some char, which can add some extra sweetness or bitterness that would affect the wine. Whereas your low impact methods, boiling, poaching, steaming, um, baking, those, are, those won't affect the wine as much. And then here's some rules. Well, guidelines are not exact, exact rules because rules are made to be broken. Uh, but these are, are good things to stand by when you consider food and wine. So wine should be equally acidic or more acidic than the food. And likewise with sweetness, wine should be equally sweet or sweeter than the food. Both of those are, are true uh, because if you have the food more acidic than the wine or more sweet than the wine, the wine will end up tasting flat or flabby or bitter or just boring. It dulls the sensation and the experience of the wine. Um, whereas you, if you match those acid levels, you match the sweetness, that's where they're really gonna sing together and you're gonna have a much, much better experience. Uh, tannin uh, loves fat. So thinking back to what tannin does in our mouth where it latches onto those enzymes in our saliva. If you introduce fat into your mouth, so butter, uh, you know, ribeye, marbled steaks or, or things like that, the tannin will instead attach to, the, to those molecules instead of your saliva. So it keeps your mouth a little happier. Tannin does not love bitter. So tannin already has a, a bitter, it can have a bitter flavor depending on which molecules there are. Um, so you don't wanna increase that bitterness using a bitter uh, food or, or vice versa. Tannin also does not love fish or fish oils. This is sort of the, the quintessential, you, don't, you shouldn't drink red with fish. I can definitely think of many examples where that's not the case. I've definitely had red wine with fish before and it's been fine, but it's a very particular, it all depends on like what we said, cooking method. Uh, is there a lot of fish oil or is it a low fish oil type of seafood? So um, again, exceptions to the rules, but in general, you want to stay away from matching tannin and fish. Uh, high alcohol and tannin will intensify spice. So this, when you think about food that's spicy, the last thing you wanna do is, is throw a Napa Cabernet on there or a super tannic um, or high alcohol Barolo, something from, from Piedmont in Italy, um, that it'll just intensify the spice and make it. Some people like hot things, I love spice, but that gets a little too much for me even. Um, overall, sweet loves spice and salt. Think of all the great you know, potato chip flavors you like or certain snack foods, like it's all about putting sweet spice and salt together. So you're always gonna be good matching those things. And then again, the intensity of the wine should match the intensity of the food. What we're talking about here is if you have a very delicate dish, so think of maybe like a crab salad, a fresh crab salad with herbs and lemon or something, you're not gonna wanna put a super intense aromatic oaky viognier or something, even though you might think, oh, white wine with a salad, that should work. But that viognier is so intense. There's a lot of aroma, there's a lot of flavor, there's a lot of richness, and it will completely overpower the delicacy of the food. So you wanna match it with something more like a Riesling or a Chablis or Sauvignon Blanc, something that is a little less intense of a wine. And my disclaimer is, you know, I kind of said this before, but every mouth is different and personal preference carries the day. So we can have all this understanding about uh, theoretical pairings, maybe historical or geographical pairings, the whole idea of what grows together goes together, which is a, a saying we could get into another time. It's, it's, it takes a while to sort of <laughs> explain that uh, theory. Um, and you, we can use science and all this objective analysis, but at the end of the day, if you love that cheese and you love it with Cabernet Sauvignon, or if you hate it, then go ahead and hate it or go ahead and love it. It's all up to you. I'm not to say what you will like the most I can only help subtly guide you or, or nudge you in a certain direction. Cheese, so now the fun part. And I really like this picture, so I wanna linger on it just for like another second because I'm looking at all these great cheeses. Oh, it was really fun to, to look up and, and learn some more stuff about cheese this week. So real quick, this will take two minutes, just going over the very basics of how cheese is made. Uh, it can be made from any type of milk, but obviously primarily this is cow milk, goat's milk, sheep milk, and then sometimes that water buffalo if you're looking for buffalo mozzarella. Um, the cheese making process, you start with that fresh milk, 
you inoculate it with a starter culture. This is, these are some beneficial bacteria. And what this does is it starts the process of converting lactose, the milk sugars in the milk, into lactic acid. So this is another form of fermentation, kind of like wine. Um, and then, then you introduce rennet. This is, can either be an enzyme taken from the stomach of a calf or an unwinged animal, or it can be made in a lab using microbials. So, so you can have non-animal versions. You can, there's, there's such thing as vegetarian cheese that doesn't have the, the animal part that way. Um, and this is added to separate curds and whey. So crucially important for most cheese types to get those curds, because that inevitably is what's going to be turned into cheese. Um, the curds are then cut either into small, you know, really, really small pieces, and then they're tightly packed, and that expels more of the liquid, more of the whey, um, and that will result in your firmer cheeses, where if you leave it uncut uh, and handle it really gently, that's where you're going to get softer cheeses. Um, you add salt next. Again, salt is super important for lots of reasons. It inhibits bacteria growth, enhances flavor. It also slows some of that enzymatic activity and can help form the rind, which is important for a lot of aged cheeses. And then how you decide to age it, um, so for how long, what sort of humidity, certain processes that we'll talk about in a minute about how to treat the rind can, can affect the cheese style. Uh, but this is, that's the, the main part of it. That's the, the nuts and bolts. And then um, I was looking up, you know, how do I split and talk about cheese or cheese styles in a way that makes sense? And there's, a whole, there's lists everywhere from there's only three styles of cheese to there's 10 styles of cheese. And I decided on six. So we're going to go with six. Um, I'm not an expert by any means. And I'm sure I will have to look up some fact checking for, for the, the PDF that we'll put on the website. But in general, here's six different categories of cheese that we'll talk about. Fresh cheeses, bloomy rind, washed rind, semi-soft the hard, firm cheese, and then blue cheese. Fresh cheese is your soft rind list. These are cheeses that aren't ages. They're usually, are not aged. They're mild, they're tangy. A lot of times they're made without that rennet step of, of, of separating those curds. Examples are ricotta, feta, even though feta is a brine cheese, they, they sort of leave it in a brine solution to give it a lot of flavor. It's still considered a fresh cheese. Cottage cheese, cream cheese, even fresh goat cheese. And the, the perfect, or at least the good pairings, for each of these categories, I'll do the good pairings, bad pairings. There's going to be a lot of stuff in between that might work, but these are just some of the big picture ideas. Um, fresh cheeses, going with that sort of intensity match, you're going to want some fresher, some lighter white wines. So sparkling wine like Cava or Prosecco, um, white wines like Riesling, Chablis, Sauvignon Blanc, Muscadet, some cool wines from Italy like Vermentino or even Provence Rosé are going to be great wines to pair with some of these softer, fresher cheeses. What to stay away from is big red wines. So your tannic, your bold, your spicy, your oaky, alcoholic red wines, they're just going to completely overpower these fresh cheeses. And I would also stay away from sweet wines, anything that has some sugar. There's probably, again, probably an exception to that, but in general, um, you'll want to stay away from those pairings. Bloomy cheese or bloomy rind cheese. Um, so it's named, the Bloomy is actually named after this white mold that, um, that appears on the outside of the cheese. Um, and I believe they call it Bloomy uh, because if you looked at the mold under a microscope, the actual mold looks like a flower. And as the cheese, and as it ripens, the, the mold actually kind of blooms, it expands and it looks like a flower blooming. Um, so this is uh, your super creamy spreadable cheeses. They can be kind of funky or strong, strongly flavored, but they'll usually be really nice and buttery and have some, some mushroomy notes. Uh, main examples of these are Brie, Camembert, Robiola, uh, Delice de Bourgogne, a personal favorite of mine. Humboldt Fog is a Northern California cheese. It's actually a goat cheese with a little ash layer, but it is a, a bloomy cheese. And then Latour, another famous cheese from Northern Italy that actually has all three milks in it. It has cow milk, sheep milk, and goat cheese, or goat milk. Pairings for these, so sort of your optimal style. Again, sparkling wine, you'll, you'll notice a trend. Sparkling wine comes back quite often <laughs> in all the cheeses, um, which it honestly is one, the reason is because it does such a good job of almost scrubbing your palate. So it helps not only spread the cheese and some of the fat all around your, your mouth, so you can sort of, you can experience it in a lot of ways, but it also helps scrub the richness and prepare you for the next bite. So it's just a really good, champagne is sort of your, quintessential pairing wine with lots of different foods. Uh, again, dry whites this time, you might uh, see some whites with a little bit of oak. So white burgundy or Chardonnay from, from France. 
uh, white Bordeaux, some Chenin Blanc, Marsan Roussan, um, and that oak, just the, the hint of oak can give you that kind of savory mushroomy quality too in it in white wines, which might go well with that mushroomy flavor. You can even start seeing some lighter reds, so unoaked light reds like Gamay Noir, if you think Beaujolais, uh, Cab Franc from the Loire Valley, Barbera. There's even Zweigelt, which is a really cool, fresh, fruity red wine from Austria. Uh, and again, bad pairings, big red wine. So Brie, for Brie and Cabernet fans, if you love it, uh, then go for it. I have all the respect in the world for you, but, but that, is, that is an intense uh, experience. Washed rind cheeses. So these cheeses are literally washed in wine or beer or cider, uh, brandy, or, or even just some brine solution, a saltwater solution before and during that aging process. And what this does is it, pr it promotes the growth of a certain bacteria. Uh, I forget the name of it. It's Brevi bacterium linens, something like that. Um, and that's what can give it that orange color and a much funkier, stinkier aroma and flavor than you would find in your bloomy rind cheeses. Most of these are really, really soft and creamy. Um, they can get mushroomy, yeasty, yeasty, even meaty quality or meaty flavors. Um, <clears throat> these cheeses were also historically known as monastic cheeses. So back in you know, Benedictine times and the monasteries in old France, uh, the monks weren't allowed to eat meat, um, but they were allowed to make cheese. And so what they did is they would protect their cheese by using what they had which was usually beer or cider or brandy or wine that they were making for sacramental purposes. And they'd wash the cheese to protect it. And then all of a sudden it would grow these weird, funky, meaty sort of umami flavors and it would remind them of meat. And so that became part of that style of, of cheese, this monastic washed rind cheese. I don't know like how 100% accurate that is, but I like the story. So I'm going with it. Uh, examples of these cheeses are Taleggio, probably one of the milder uh, options out of these, this, family of cheese. Uh, Limburger, you have uh, Epois de Bourgogne, which is a, a very famous one from Burgundy region in France. Uh, Morbier, and then Gruyere. You'll actually see Gruyere again, but this is one of the instances where it doesn't necessarily have to be a soft, creamy cheese, that you can still wash the rind and age it a little bit longer. And Gruyere is one of those styles of cheese. So it's not necessarily creamy. It could be, it could be harder. Good pairings for these. So this is where you could get in, um, into fun aromatic whites. So think Viognier, Gewürztraminer, Pinot Gris, especially from Alsace in France. They, they can just be beautifully floral and, and, and really aromatic. And a lot, of, a lot of times that can go well with the funk. That can actually help play, with, play around with those funky flavors and aromas in the cheese. Um, you can also look at more aged whites and aged champagnes. So the, the more oxidized, the longer the wine's been aging, you'll get more nutty flavors, creamier flavors, um, creamier flavors, creamier textures, and a bunch of other complexities in the wine that could go well with funky cheeses. Um, again, you could show some lighter red, so Beaujolais, Gamay Noir, and Pinot Noir. And then I've heard that some people really like sweet wines or some dessert wines like Vinsanto from Tuscany or Tawny Port. Um, bad pairings, big red wine. Noticing a trend. <laughs> Semi-soft cheese. So this is probably the one category of cheese that isn't necessarily a processed thing because you can have semi-soft in, in a lot of the other categories, but I thought there was enough recognizable cheeses that were considered semi-soft for it to be uh, a category. So these are mild in flavor, very creamy texture. They're great for melting, for slicing. So we're thinking of young Gouda, so that red wax Gouda, Havarti, uh, again, Gruyere, sort of semi-soft, even though it's a washed rind cheese, Provolone, Jarlsberg, um, these you can, again, do with white wines. White wines are also, in general, white wines will pair with cheese better than red wines. I'll just say that now. You can, you can sort of see as we've gone through, a lot of white wines are good with cheese. Um, these are dry whites. So again, we're thinking of Chardonnay, white Bordeaux, some Rhone whites, even white Rioja, which is from Northern Spain, which can definitely have some oak influence, but, um, but that's actually really nice with these cheeses. Um, and then even as far as oxidized wines from the Jura, so this is a, an Alpine region in, in Eastern France. Um, as far as reds, do you wanna go maybe with that rustic red? So more light to medium bodied reds like Cote de Rhone, um, Grenache blends from Southern France, Chianti, which is Sangiovese blends from Tuscany, um, Menthia or Mencia from Northwestern Spain, a really cool sort of mineral fruity, light, lighter body, medium bodied wine. And then your basic clarets from Bordeaux. So not your 
Cabernet Sauvignon and really big structured ones, but the more Merlot based, um, easy drinking um, Bordeaux. And bad pairings, big red wine. So <laughs> we're talking big tannin, big alcohol. They, they get a bad rap, but it's okay. We're getting there. Hard firm cheeses. Oh, my, probably my favorite. So these are cheeses that are aged, you know, more or less for a year, um, but they can be aged much longer than that as well. These are the lowest moisture. So obviously the longer it ages, the, the more moisture, you know, leaves the cheese resulting in that, that craggy sort of shard like texture, which crumbles. You get really nutty, complex, savory notes, a lot of umami that sort of that fifth uh, flavor, which is the savory flavor. Uh, and then these can also, uh, be more salty and it's really just because they're more concentrated. There's less moisture so that saltiness is also concentrated. Here we're thinking about Parmigiano Reggiano cheese which I hope most people have in their pantry or in their fridge at all times. It's, it's considered the king of cheeses. It's great for, for many many things. Uh, Gouda, your cheddars, Pecorino which is a sheep's milk cheese from Italy from different places in Italy. Manchego again sheep's milk from, from uh, Spain and Asiago. Um, good pairings, champagne. Champagne goes with everything and it's just beautiful, 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 especially with Parmigiano Reggiano. Um, but this is where you can get a little bit of off dry whites. And hey, look at this, big red wine. So for those big red wine drinkers out there, there's a cheese for you and it's a firm, hard, nutty aged cheese. Um, I did a little a side note for some of the posts on Instagram and Facebook. I ended up doing a little comment with some hints and tips. If you didn't see it, it's totally fine. Um, but one of the things I said was, was to, if you're going to just get a cheese that's sort of a universal cheese, pick a hard, firm, nutty cheese. I also mentioned something about bubbles and brie or with soft, spreadable cheese. And then the last thing is actually I'll talk about next. Um, and then this is where you can get uh, dry oxidized or fortified wine. So those off-dry whites could be, again, that Gewürztraminer from Alsace, some off-dry Rieslings from Germany, maybe, um, but your big reds. Barolo, Bordeaux, Rioja, Brunello, Amarone, Amontillado and Oloroso Sherry are some dry styles of sherry, which are also really great. Um, they have that oxidative quality, that nutty quality in the wine, which goes really well with the nutty quality in the cheese. Um, and then the oaky white is maybe the bad pairing with Cali Chardonnay. I'm specifically thinking of Parmesan with that, but I'm sure you can find a cheddar or some of these other cheeses that go well with California Chardonnay. Again, this, this is the cheese that will pair with the most types of wines. So you can't necessarily go really wrong with it. But one thing you'll notice, there's also, I didn't really mention a lot of new world red wines. And part of that is because in general, if, if the wine is over 14.5% alcohol, that's considered high alcohol. It's considered a pretty robust wine. And that's when food pairing in general, but specifically cheese pairing can get really tricky when the alcohol is too high. Um, now there's a difference when you have high alcohol wines that are balanced, that have enough acidity in them where they don't really come across as really warm and spicy and, and alcoholic, like I'd consider our wines of the Venia to be in that vein. Um, but, but in general, you know, the America, Washington wines, California, they can tend to be pretty alcoholic or pretty, pretty ripe and big. And so it can be a little trickier actually when, when pairing with cheese. Last category. Blue cheese. I love blue cheese. It's, I know people who absolutely hate it and won't touch it. It's totally fine. Um, blue cheese can be any of the styles we've talked about before. I think mine is fresh. You can't really have fresh blue cheese. I could be wrong. Um, and this is made from a, a mold. So Penicillium Roqueforti is the technical term, at least the original blue mold for, for cheeses. Um, and that's injected or into the cheese. And they usually do it with these thin needles or they use thin needles to introduce oxygen because it actually won't turn blue unless there's oxygen to turn it blue. Um, and this is, you know, this is where you get super funky, piquant, salty, strong, tangy, just really intense cheese. If we're talking about intensity level, this is at 11. Examples are Gorgonzola, Stilton, Roquefort, um, some of my personal favorites, Forme d'Ambert, saint Agure, some beautiful, beautiful French blue cheeses. Um, and this is where it gets really tricky with, with wine pairings. Um, that this was the third thing in the notes I, I posted on Instagram and Facebook was that blue cheese is really hard to pair with wines. And it's because with all that salt, with all the funkiness, you really need to have a sweet wine to balance it out. Think of it this way. If, if it's, um, if you're kind of replacing a compote or like a cherry compote or fig spread with wine, you want, cause you want to have this like contrasting pairing of crazy funky with 
beautiful, sweet, fruity stuff. And that's, that's going to be what works the, the best. Or even like honey, if you can find a wine that's kind of like honey. So that brings us to Sauterne or ice wine or some late harvest Rieslings from, um, from Germany. A lot of these wines actually have a honeyed flavor and it's from a particular thing called botrytis or noble rot. Um, some of the best wine, sweet wines and dessert wines in the world are affected by botrytis. And it, what it does is it gives it this um, both honeyed sort of sweet flavor and aroma, but it also can be kind of saffrony, mushroomy, gingery. There's a really exotic spices um, that can go into wines affected by botrytis. And so that's why this can be really fun and unique with blue cheese. Um, you can also look at tawny port, LBV, which is late bottled vintage port, Madeira, some cream sherry is delicious uh, with blue cheese, and then Vinsanto again from Tuscany. This is the one place I wanted to just, you know, make a, a to fly the beer flag for a second, because uh, obviously beer and cheese also go well together. You could, we could do a whole pairing uh, session on, on beer and cheese, but particular blue cheese, double IPAs, sweet stouts, and barley wine, any of these really multi fruity beers can also be really, really great with blue cheese. Um, and then, like I said, bad pairings, most, most other dry wines. So final thoughts, I kind of mentioned this before. Um, when you put together a cheese board or, or a, a whole accompaniment, some of the jams, compotes, chutneys, spreads, you have your crackers, bread, olives, almonds, there can be lots of stuff, even fresh fruits like grapes, fresh grapes. Those are all great and it can make the spread look beautiful. It's fun to sort of mix and match all those together. Uh, but when it comes to the actual wine pairing, sometimes it can really affect and overpower wines, particularly those compotes, chutneys, and jams. And it goes back to what we talked about with matching sweetness or acidic levels. A lot of times that food ends up being more acidic and more sweet than the wine you're drinking. And so the wine will just taste bitter and kind of flabby. Um, so when consider making, if you're doing this exercise or want to do cheese and wine together and really appreciate the pairing, I would just do cheese and wine. No need for crackers, no need for anything else and just really dive into those flavors together. And then, you know, humans in general have a hard time describing what we taste. Uh, we're a very visual people. We can, we can describe, you know, what we're seeing for a thousand, a thousand words on a page. But saying what we're tasting is hard. There's a, a really cool master of wine in the UK who does this experiment with her in her classes where she has people blind taste and she either gives them a strawberry or a raspberry and they have to taste it and all they have to do is tell her if it's a strawberry or, or if it's a strawberry or raspberry, can they tell what it is? And without fail, every single person can say that, yep, yeah, this is a strawberry or this is a raspberry. But when she asked them to, to say why and describe how they know it's a raspberry, how they know it's a strawberry, it's really hard for them to talk about what they're tasting and how to actually, you know, describe those sensations. It's just not a language. It's not a terminology that we use all the time. So like any skill, it just takes practice. The thing I would encourage everyone to do is just taste a lot of wine, taste food, talk about it, get to know what those sense memories are for you, what you what's in your mind mouth, a cool term a friend of mine created. Uh, and the more we talk about it and build that terminology, the easier it'll be to, to talk about this stuff. So that is the end of the presentation parts. Thanks for sticking with me. Thank you for the applause. Thank you, thank you. Um, so at this point, I know that that was a lot of information. Um, I thought I sped through it, but of course it still took me about a half an hour because I just tend to talk and get excited about things. But at this point, I think it's time to maybe hear from a couple of you. Um, and whether you want to just share, you know, if you're drinking a wine right now, or if you have a cheese, maybe just tell me what cheeses, what wines you're having. Uh, and then we can just sort of talk about what's going on. Mike, I saw you on mute. Do you want to, do you want to tell me what you're, what you're having? Yeah, I was, uh, I was, you talk a lot about the big red wines and, and I was just curious of your thoughts about the difference between the the big red uh, American cabs and say the, the difference between the Italian wines, Barolos are really big and, you know, uh, and Br uh, Brunello is a little bit lighter than that. So how, as you compare some of the big Italian wines and French wines and American wines, what, what, what's, what advice would you give us as we're trying to pair those? Yeah, it's a good question. It's it's really tricky because it does come down, it can come down to producer by producer because there's so many decisions that can be made to make, even if you are a Barolo producer, to make your wines in a way that are a little less intense or, or not as bombastic and, and big. Um, but likewise, you, if you're 
a Napa Cab producer, you can make it in a way that's actually really elegant and graceful and, and lower alcohol, depending on when you're picking and a lot of the other decisions in the cellar. Um, so it can be, it can A, be really tricky, B, in general, even with that, I still believe overall, you're gonna come across more old world wine. So European, your Brunellos, Barolos, Bordeaux, um, will have a little more elegance. Even, even your big Barolos, they can be very strong, but there's a balance in them that I think is hard to come by in, in other spots in the US or in the new world. Um, again, you know, and I think if we were talking about food and wine pairing in general, there's a lot more options to pair big red wines with when we can talk more about meat and about other, other dishes and things. It just gets really tricky with cheese in particular because there's sort of this built-in delicacy, I think, of, of matching cheeses. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Renee. Is there like a universal donor type of wine, like a wine that all sommeliers keep in their back pocket for pairing questions that usually like no matter what kind of food or what kind of cheese is a good bet even for the most picky of customers. Totally. Uh, so I, I mean, champagne would be the first to come to mind. There's a lot of, a lot of Psalms, a lot of wine people that say that it's, it's their desert island wine. So it's the wine they would take it no matter what, because it can, it can pair with so many things. And some of that I think is more a function of its of its texture, the fact that it's bubbly and that it can, again, like cleanse your palate. So no matter sort of what you're eating, it can help sort of the process along because you get to like scrub your, your teeth and your, and your tongue with all these tiny little delicious bubbles. Um, but also just because it's, it's acid driven, but it also has some like nutty yeasty components. Um, it's just a super food friendly wine. As far as still wines, I was trying to think of when I was pairing a lot, wines that would pop up all the time were white burgundy. So um, Chardonnay from France tends to be, it can, it just can be, again, balanced between acidity, um, earthiness, but also fruitiness, a little bit of oak, but not too much oak. And, then, and white burgundy can pair with a lot of different things. Um, so that would be, that would be another sort of jack of all trades, <laughs> uh, a wine for pairing purposes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah Mary Margaret. Um, on the on the champagne front, I mean, do you make a distinction then between sparkling wines from the U.S. or other places, and champagne, and and the differences, you know, in this in this context? Yeah. So yes, for the most part, like champagne, and I tried doing that. I didn't really actually explain that well in the presentation because sometimes I said sparkling wine, sometimes I said champagne specifically. Um, there are wines all over the world that are made in the champagne uh, method. So this is the traditional method where you're doing the second fermentation in bottle, and that will result in more complex aromas. It's where you get more of that yeasty sort of brioche bready, breadiness uh, in champagne. Um, and that can work better with, with some of those slightly firmer cheeses. So the semi-soft, maybe the, the really the washed rind where you get a little more intensity. It's a way to add intensity with sparkling wine, whereas your Prosecco, your cava, things that aren't made in the same uh, method. Those are different methods. Though, well, cava can be champagne method, so that's that's not true. But a lot of cava is 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 cheap, really quaffable, and it's just not as complex. Those can be more for fresh cheeses and things like that. But yeah, there are like um, one of the other places is in, in Italy is called Franciacorta. So this is in Lombardy in northern Italy, and they're they're basically the champagne of Italy. So it's traditional method. You can get really complex, nutty, you know, beautiful aged Franciacorta that can, can, you know, hold with the, the best champagnes in the world um, that are still considered that style. Thanks. What are, does anyone want to share uh, what cheese they're having? Yeah, Logan? We are having a smoked goat Gouda Whoa. with a California Pinot Noir. Oh yeah, how is that going? It's going really well. The uh, seems like to me that the the Pinot Noir is probably just the alcohol in the wine allows the taste just to spread out over your whole mouth, mm -hmm. and it really at first it really enhances the smoked part of the Gouda, and then the end I pick up a lot more of the goat. Oh yeah, like the acidity and the and the freshness too. Yeah, that's cool. That's it's fun. Um, that's such a unique cheese because I've never I've never heard of smoked I've heard of smoked gouda but I've never heard of smoked goat gouda. I mean it sounds delicious but it's but that's an interesting like conundrum. Luckily Logan actually 
asked me this a couple of days ago because he was like, well, we're going to do this cheese. What should I have with it? And I was like, maybe California Pinot. And I think it's because, you know, you have more acidity because it's goat cheese, it's goat's milk. Um, but the smokiness is something where if you have a smoked cheese, feel free to grab a big red. That's what maybe one of the exceptions of big reds don't don't pair with cheese. If you have a, a smoked cheddar or smoked gouda, anything that smokes that again, that impacts that high impact cooking technique that gives it more char and more, more intensity of flavor, that you'll be able to hold that or hold up to more big red wines. So I was thinking, yeah, California Pinot um, can have a little more substantial flavor and, and, and even aged in oak, you might get some of those same kind of smoky characteristics from the wine, but that's cool. It sounds delicious. <laughs> it is. Come yeah. visit us and we'll give you some. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Renee, you're on me What cheese did you have? Um, I wanted to know, like you said that rules were meant to be broken. As a small yay and as someone who has his own palate and taste preferences, what rules, wine, cheese rules, do you break because you don't care what everyone says and you love the pairing? Oh. Even if you aren't supposed to. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think... When I break the rules, it's usually because I'm just not in the mood to think about pairing. <laughs> and so it's like, hey, there's cab open. We should drink that. And like, hey, we're going to have some cheese. All right, I'm just going to get rid of that part of my brain for a minute and just sort of go in and enjoy this and it'll be fantastic. <laughs> um, so I don't, I don't know if there's one that I'm particularly rebellious about <laughs> in, 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 you know, fl flying that flag for. But, but yeah, that's... That's probably how I that. Shelly, what, what cheese, or Donna, you're unmuted. Oh, okay. I have we have the Point Reyes blue cheese and, and we routinely break your rule. Um, we, have, we have it with the Sestina tonight. And I think we've always liked that pairing of the cab with blue cheese because we like to crumble blue cheese over steak. Yeah, that, no, that's great. And, and honestly, I think I, I definitely have had blue cheeses before. And it, I think because blue cheese can range in style where it can be crumbly or or fudgy, kind of like a Stilton, or it can be really smooth, like a Combozola, sort of a triple cream mm -hmm. cheese. There is, there is so much variety that you can find a lot of different wines that will pair better with-, with Yeah, and blue. that's why we like the Point Rays because it is a milder blue yep. cheese. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. stinky, it's just very flavorful. And then we wanted to do the other extreme too. So we got, we have a Madeira. Oh, cool. That we had open for a little while, it's a, a, a broad bent. Yep. Uh, Boal, which is their oh, sweeter, sweeter yeah. Yeah. And so, so we're kind of getting the steakhouse version of blue cheese <laughs> and also the dessert version of blue cheese. And we kind of like them both. I, yeah. I think I might like the Cab a little more just because I like the Sestina yeah. a little more than Madeira, but they're both very cleansing and, and mix, match well. Oh, the rest of the Madeira is going to go into a chicken dish. Oh, <laughs> that's, fair. that's very fair. <laughs> Thanks. That's Thanks very good. Shelly, what cheese do you have? Okay, so I'm drinking an Oregon Pinot. Beautiful. It's delicious. And I had three different cheeses because I like cheese. So I had a Vermont cheddar for all my Vermonters on here. I Which had... One? Which one? <laughs> it was one that I had never heard of before. Do you remember, Eli, when we picked it out? Well, so yeah. Full disclosure, I have the same three because I was my wife and so we decided this together. Um, I actually tried to look up this cheese, this and it's apple knocker cheddar, which I had never heard of. It was avail it was at our local thrift way. Um, but but it's it's good. It's a little bitter, which I think is interesting. So yeah, I had the Vermont cheddar, I had an aged gouda, and then I have this like truffle cow cheese. It's like a semi-soft um, and it has a bunch of truffle in it. And that one, I think, goes so well with the Pinot Noir. Um, and I thought maybe you would want to say a little bit about grows together, goes together with Pinot and truffle. Yeah. So, and, and it's, you know, it's um, truffle, like Pinot in general can have this mushroomy character to it. A lot of, bur if you think about red burgundy, sometimes there can be a, a mushroom truffle kind of aroma, especially from aged Pinot Noir. Um, and so it's pretty, it's, very often that when you have a mushroom in any dish, it could be a mushroom risotto or a mushroom pasta or mushroom cheese, one of the first wines you'll think of is Pinot Noir. Um, the other ones I think 
would be similar is, is maybe even some Barbaresco or, or Nebbiolo from Piedmont because they, there's truffles grown or found in Piedmont. Um, but, but because that sort of light, lighter style of wine, Burgundy or Pinot Noir, organ being sort of a Burgundian style usually of Pinot Noir is, is a great way to match that mushroomy earthy flavor with a mushroomy earthy red wine. And yeah, that grows, grows together, goes together. Um, you know, a lot of it is, is just historical. It just happened to be, you know, that certain wine regions, there'd also be farms, they'd be milking cows or, or sheep and make cheese. And it's just what they ended up having with the kind of wines they had on hand. But in certain areas, like the, the famous example is Chevre or goat's cheese from the Loire Valley and then Loire Valley Sauvignon Blanc, like Sancerre or Puy Fumé. Both are very acidic, so they match in that acidity profile. They can both be really grassy and herbaceous or herby and even have that kind of mineral tinge to it too. So those, it's sort of this classic, well, you might as well drink the wine that's right down the road because it matches perfectly with, with what's here. Um, it's a similar thing with um, or Parmigiano Reggiano and Amarone. So that's, I mean, Amarone is sort of nearby, but it's, it's you know, close to that, that area. But it is interesting to see whether it's been just by accident that things pair together, even though they're from the same area, or if there really is some sort of like scientific explanation of why they work really well. So my other comment was, I'm not totally loving the pairing of the Vermont cheddar with the Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. um, Vermont cheddar, I mean, to me, it's so sharp, right? Like it's pretty acidic, it's pretty sharp. So do you have a recommendation for a pairing to go with a very sharp Vermont cheddar? Yeah, I mean, I guess what I would do is I'd either try to go on the edge of sweetness. So choosing a wine a red wine maybe that has um, the profile of almost dried fruit. So something like Amarone or even some Zinfandels or um, certain grapes that you can actually taste, um, they taste almost raisinated where they have almost a dried fruit quality. And to me, that's almost like adding fig spread or like fig jam to cheese. And I think that would go really well with this, with this cheddar. Um, or pulling, like staying on the sweetness side, but maybe pulling back intensity and doing something like Lambrusco or like some, or some, maybe an off dry, um, an off dry, even an off dry white. So I think like a, an Alsace Pinot Gris, something that has a little bit of sugar, but still is pretty, pretty weighty. Like it still has a bunch of intensity to match to cheddar, which can be a pretty strong flavor sometimes in that sharpness. This particular one too, I think, it's, it's, um, it seems bitter and I'm not sure what that is, whether it's just the, that sharpness, the tanginess, um, but, but again, bitter can be really hard to pair with wine. And that's why I think maybe some sweetness would help. That's, that's probably what I'd say. Yeah, but that's, so what I'm drinking, I have the same three cheeses that Shelly does, um, but I chose two different wines. I chose a white and a red. The white is our, our Sauvignon Blanc, the Olean uh, Sauvignon Blanc, which does see a little bit of oak uh, most, it's all neutral barrel, but there is still sort of that creamier texture. And that actually is, is also a pretty cool with this truffle semi-soft cheese in a different way. And I think it's because the Sauvignon Blanc can have, again, that, er that sort of slightly herbal uh, feel to it. And I think the herb and mushroom go really well together. Um, and then the red wine I have is, it's one of our newer wines. If you haven't had it yet, it's the 2018 Parapine. So this is a Grenache that we just released on Halloween of last year, but uh, it's actually a lighter, a lighter style Grenache than, than you might expect. So to me, it almost smells more like a Pinot Noir. So this is, it's more to me in that spectrum of, of Grenache than some others. And, um, and I think this is actually really good with the truffle cheese also. And I think because that, that truffle kind of is asking for a red wine to, to pair with it but it's also not too intense. It's not too, too big and rich. Eli, you might've answered my question, but where, where do the Zinfandels fit in the best? So I would, it's hard because Zinfandels again, can, can range in style. Cause you can have stuff from Dry Creek and Sonoma or stuff from Paso Robles or sort of all over California that can be either really concentrated and more of that, that, higher alcohol burgeoning on sweet style. Um, or you can have them that are really, really refined and elegant. Um, 
that are more like Grenache, like the, like this kind of Grenache can, reminds me kind of like a Zinfandel. Um, but again, I would still probably go towards a firmer, sort of harder, nuttier cheese um, to, to do Zinfandel with. I was gonna do that. If, but if it wasn't gonna be cheese, it would be barbecue. So, and, and I guess it would be smoked cheeses. So if you were gonna do Zinfandel, maybe like a smoked Gouda or like a smoked cheese actually would be really good as well. Yeah, thank you. Scott sent us a case of eight years in the desert, so we got to eat a lot of cheese, I guess. <laughs> Say, that's a that's a good problem to have. <laughs> You're making me rethink my cheese board strategy because I would normally like pick, uh, you know, uh, a, a fresh cheese and a, a you know a super hard cheese. You know, I'd go all over the map. So, I guess I'm just serving champagne from now on. <laughs> That's great. Well, it's funny because it's, it's, I think it also depends on where your cheese board is landing. Like if, if it's a cheese board to be an appetizer or like before a meal, you might have a different strategy than if it's an after dinner cheese. Um, like if it's, and if it's before a meal, you know, uh, I hear people say all the time, it should always be an odd number of cheeses. It should either be, either be like three or five, but it's weird to have two or four. I don't know how much truth there is to that, but, but but I do. I don't think there's anything wrong with having a variety. Variety in cheese boards is is crucial because you because you never know what people's styles or people's preferences are going to be. So to have maybe a goat or something softer or something firmer or something blue, I think is is awesome. Um, I think it would more just depend on on if you are deciding to provide like cheese cheese board or a cheese experience with wine, then maybe like think a little bit more about well you know, most of these cheeses are like soft or younger, like maybe we'll just do a bunch of different sparklers and white wines and then see how people like, maybe it's in the summer. Or if you wanna do cheese after dinner, you just choose one cheese, like you choose one rich blue or one, you know, something that's decadent and pair it with a decadent dessert wine. And that, and that way it can be this sort of cap to a great meal, but less about like, oh, let's try a bunch of cheeses and a bunch of things. But yeah, but yeah, it totally, it changed my, my uh, calculus as well about how to plan cheese boards. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, any other questions? I know we're, we're getting close to, close to the end here, but um, I just had so much fun. I just love cheese and wine. Papa, you gotta- Our county here in, in Vermont has the most cheese of any county in the, in the you know, cheese makers. Mm -hmm. And one of the big ones is goat cheese. Goat cheese is very big here. In Addison County, so just goat cheese. What wine will I have with it? I know you've sort of addressed this, but yeah. Tell me. Um, do you like white wines? Do you sure. drink white wines often? Any white. Yeah, I would. I would go with with white wine with with uh, sh you know a Chablis, like something like a really nice, fresh, simple Chablis from uh, a Chardonnay from France. Um, even even a Sauvignon Blanc from France, some Sancerre, some Puy Fumé, things like that. Um, bubbles again. So if you wanted to get some champagne or even some some cava, I think cava is really good. Um, I always get sort of a green apple, lemon lime aroma from a lot of cava. So sort of those really citrusy, bright notes in the wine, and I think that goes really well with goat cheese. Um, honestly, or lager. If you want to drink a beer, just drink a light beer and goat cheese. That's also really nice. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, you got it. Well, I think I think that does it for for today. Um, thanks for joining. Uh, again, sort of a reminder that I'm here every Thursday, so we have different topics on our on our website posted for what's coming up the next two months, um, and then that's where you'll also find a link to the video. So after this, we'll edit the video and post it on YouTube so that you can see it, or if other people missed it and wanted to watch, they can do that. And then if the ice misspoke. Especially if you guys are like, hey, by the way, you said something about bacteria and I think you're wrong. Let me know and I'll correct it and I'll put it in our fact check or our questions, on it, unanswered questions. And that way, you know, I can cover my conscience of it. So, um, so thank you all so much. It's so nice to see all your faces and thanks for joining me with some cheese and wine. Uh, next week we're doing uh, the vineyard. I think we're doing sort of the life cycle or the year in a vineyard. So, so we'll be a little more educational. Awesome. All right, well, if you want, the last thing, I always like when people unmute and um, to say goodbye. So if you felt like unmuting and saying goodbye, then we'll do that. Uh, bye, Eli, you're the best. Bye, thank you. Bye, bye. 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 bye.